Hello, it's Scott Manley here. A couple of nights ago, Elon Musk got up on stage at Boca Chica to give the latest Starship update. You've probably seen a couple of other videos about this. I'm a late comer, but I do want to talk about it, and I'm sure I'd like to think I have a few things you might not have heard elsewhere. But yes, uh, this was the first update in two years. It was very clearly not a hugely technical presentation aimed for the hardcore SpaceX nerds that have been watching every single thing that's going down at, at Boca Chica. Uh, it's definitely aimed at the people that might be involved with regulatory agencies like the FAA or people that were at NASA that are obviously interested in uh, Starship for its human landing system. And so, yeah, the presentation it was Elon on stage giving a talk on its own. And you know, in the spirit of the last couple of years, in spirit of the pandemic, it began with some audio problems, some echo from somebody that had their mic open. It was like, welcome, welcome, welcome. I've got an echo. You know, Elon Musk, we all understand he's not the greatest speaker. You know, that's fine. He, he does a lot of he has a lot of other great positive qualities that we should appreciate. But um, the thing is, no matter how awkward or disjointed his delivery was, it was lent a great deal of gravitas by the fact that he was giving this talk in front of the largest rocket ever built by humans, arguably the largest flying machine ever built, right? So the booster, uh, Booster 4, Starship 20, they'd been stacked, they'd been dressed up for the presentation in the last couple of days beforehand, right? Like they painted the engine bells that had been you know, they've been tested, so they cleaned them up. They put on fairings over the back end of the booster to cover up the boat tail height, the engine power head, a lot of the plumbing, cover up those COPVs so it was just this, you know, perfectly covered, shiny stainless steel thing. The heat shield on Starship 20 is looking a lot better. And then after placing the booster on the orbital launch platform using a crane, they stacked it on Wednesday night using stage zero. That is the launch tower. And, you know, Elon touched on, well, he actually talked about the launch tower quite a bit. And he mentioned that it had been built, designed and built in pretty impressive time, 13 months. And, you know, for comparison, Remember that NASA is having a second launch tower built for SLS, for the Block 1B or whatever, the cargo version. And that's going to cost over a billion dollars for that. And it doesn't even have moving parts and it's going to take more than 13 months. But yeah, this thing has these moving chopsticks that can ascend and pick things up and very carefully adjust. It's not just picking the things up, but it has these anchor points that can move back and forth so it can twist it and translate it and put it exactly on top. So we got to watch the first attempt at this operation on Wednesday night. And yeah, it was kind of uh, surreal to watch this 100 ton thing slowly ascend up the side and all these drones zipping around trying to make sure that the things were lined up correctly before carefully putting it on the top. There were some other tweets from, from Elon that actually showed some uh, ca different camera angles and uh, Lab Padre had some great cameras that got some fantastic upskirts, you know, some, well, some shots up, you know what I mean, right? Um, yeah, so uh, the, uh, the other side of this, of course, is that, you know, uh, aspirationally, as, as Elon said, they want to catch boosters on these arms, right? Which as he said, it sounds insane or audacious. Uh, like, and I think he delivered his his first great dad joke, where, where he said that, well, you know, if the booster does come in too fast and shear off the arms, then that will be a farewell to arms. There were actually a couple of dad jokes in this whole presentation, and to be fair, um, Elon is a has a lot of kids, so he's pretty good at dad jokes, I would imagine, by this point. Um. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to say that uh, while, well, okay, we can talk about the rest of the presentation a bit, but I I'm going to say, like, the presentation was definitely given uh, with the assumption that Booster 4 with Starship 2420, these numbers that keep coming around, uh, would be the ones to fly the first test flight. And I'm beginning to think that that may no longer happen for the simple reason that there has been a significant time between the initial construction of Booster 4 and the current moment. And there has been a lot of uh, you know, iteration. They had started building Booster 5 and then they stopped 
doing that. Now Booster 7 is the one they're working on. It could be that by the time they're ready to launch, that this one is that set up may not be the one they go with. I don't know. This is me just making a sort of prediction. Really, um, we should probably talk about the presentations, which, yeah, as I said, given by Elon on his own, using like Keynote in front of this big booster. And I'm going to say, it, it, so while it started out with these great aspirational you know, statements about uh, basically preserving the species and preserving the spark of consciousness. This is the reason why you know, going to Mars is so critical and core to the values of what SpaceX is. Why Elon started SpaceX was because he'd originally wanted to send some you know, little greenhouse to Mars and Russia were screwing around on price. Um, but once he got off of that, it very quickly went away from the previous presentations that had been all about like, we want to put hundreds of people and you will fly with a hundred other people and spend three months in space and you're going to land at Mars and whatever. No, this was almost much more about this is a fully reusable booster which and, and Starship which will deliver a hundred tons to orbit. And that's like the frequent reflight, the up mass capability because sure, sending people to Mars is a interesting goal but Starship will be more important for its ability to deliver large amounts of mass to or, or low earth orbit and be fully reusable. That's the real transformative power assuming they can pull it off. And you know I'm going to say that the, the speech he also included this sort of dose of reality about what it would mean to live on up Mars. It's going to be cramped, it's going to be dangerous, it's going to be hard work it's quite possible that you would die. This is a dangerous pioneer lifestyle and people that are going to do this are going to be under no illusion. It's funny in the last year I've seen you know several articles from people that are acting like all these billionaires are going to go to space and Mars to escape the problems on earth. It's like that you know if billionaires want to escape problems on earth they can go to private islands and find all sorts of other ways of not paying taxes. They don't need to go to Mars. Uh, going to Mars is exactly the opposite of avoiding problems. But yeah, um, another thing that was left out of the presentation was there was no mention during the main presentation of point-to-point -point transport, right? There's none of the stuff that would get the FAA a little concerned about flying people on ballistic missiles across the world. Uh, although it's worth noting that SpaceX has actually, at this point, got some funding to at least investigate this kind of thing for the Department of Defense. So it's interesting that they actually have money for this and this is the first presentation where he hasn't talked about it at all. He did talk about it in the Q&A later. But the really interesting thing that I, I, I found, well I think that probably was the bulk of the new information was the state of Raptor 2. So Raptor 2 is the evolution of Raptor. We've previously had the, the first gen Raptor and there was a sort of second generation iteration which was like the Raptor boost engine but uh, now we've got Raptor 2 that's the thing going forward and they had one of them on display next to a Raptor 1 and look it was a huge night and day moment like Raptor 2 looks much cleaner much simpler and we were informed that it del delivers more thrust it uses much fewer parts and it's about half the cost and you know, Elon went on this sort of like anti-flange rampage or whatever. <laughs> he just talked about how much he hated flanges and he was replacing everything with welds, which is great if you don't have to like take the engine apart to investigate it. You know, flanges fail for all sorts of, or, or they're weak points. And if you can replace it with a perfect weld, you're going to get better performance. But yeah, then it does mean it's hard to investigate the interior. Um, but look, putting these two engines side by side, it does look like an amazing transition, but it isn't strictly true, this, this comparison, because the Raptor 2 they showed without like the fuel line, which would have to come down and feed fuel into the, the inlet, it also didn't have like the thrust structure for how it would be mounted to the rocket or the gimbal. Those were pretty much integral parts of Raptor 1, so you couldn't get rid of them. But those were missing, so you got to understand there that wouldn't be the engine as it was mounted on the booster. There would be some extra stuff in there adding a bit more complexity. But all the same, it's clearly a better engine. It's clearly evolved. I also think that 
um, there, there is a subtle change to the shape of the engine bell. And I think, I think it's because they've expanded the throat. I can't be sure, but they're getting higher thrust and it would make sense if they expanded the throat a little. So that changes the curve because they're going to have the same uh, not like ratio at the, the same bell size at the output. So they're changing their nozzle ratio. Anyway, that's how they get more thrust. And that explains the slight change. And in the presentation, we got to see some glorious test footage of the Raptor 2. And that was one thing that Elon talked about a lot was they're trying to find this balance between getting as much power out of the engine and not melting the engine. Like, I think the number he said, there's like, there's like a gigawatt of power, right? Hey, Starship's like a, like, like a, the, the time traveling DeLorean, right? 1.21 gigawatts, which is, yeah, it's a whole lot of heat power, right? I worked at a nuclear power station for one summer and both reactors together would generate about one point something gigawatts of power. So getting that in one rocket engine, that's just the, think about it, it's a lot. But you're trying to balance this out. You know, they have various cooling mechanisms. You're generating like film cooling inside the, against the walls that protects them. But the more film cooling you have, the more you're losing performance because you're having more uncombusted fuel coming out the end. So trying to get as close to the point where the engine is stable and not melting, but not actually melting, is what they're trying to do here. So the, the new Raptor is, according to the presentation, is generating something like 230 tonnes of thrust. And the previous one was down about 185. The chamber pressure is uh, well over 300 bar. They've tested it up to 327 bar for a while, but it's nice to have some margin. So I won't be surprised if they end up operating it at just over 300 for a while. And I think it was stated that they're building like just under one a day, maybe five a week. Uh, and that will mean that they have enough to actually build and fly a booster by the end of March, which sort of feeds back into my thing, thinking about whether booster four will be the first one, to, whether it'll actually perform an orbital flight. Anyway, the other bit of new footage, I guess, was uh, a new animation showing the launch and flight to Mars. Uh, one of the changes that we've seen is the, the refueling or the refilling, as he wants to call it, because it's mostly oxygen, uh, fair enough, is it's switched to piggyback instead of butt to butt. Wait, what, what's that? Okay, uh, it, it's, it's basically that instead. And sure, it's neither here nor there. It comes down to whatever works well. Uh, I think that uh, having the two shiny sides come back to back probably makes more sense from minimizing potential damage to the heat shield. It means you're never touching any areas of the heat shield that have tiles on them. Um, they, he talked about the three or so potential customers that are, or, well, are officially publicly involved with this. And that's of course, Starlink, which, hey, surprise, surprise, but uh, Artemis human landing system and uh, Dear Moon. And while they mentioned other things that they might be working on, they were basically saying they didn't want to actually, you know, blow their cover, let's say. And we know, for example, that um, he spent some time with uh, Isaac Paulmutter talking about building a bigger version of Hubble. Wouldn't that be, well, maybe not Hubble, but building a bigger space telescope and perhaps building lots of them. Now, he also made it clear that the vehicle that they have right now with its current dimensions is merely like their first version. And there is lots of room to modify this. Raptor 2 in particular, by increasing the thrust, allows them to put more you know, load on it at launch. And they can make that first stage booster longer by stretching it. I mean, they can't expand the radius. That's a whole different problem that's never gonna happen, but they can stretch it by adding extra rings in there if they need, to, if they have the capability. So they could stretch Starship as well. and also talked about they're very likely to move Starship over to nine engines with three regular sea level Raptors for landing and six vacuum Raptors for a general power during flight. And this is actually something that's probably going to be essential if they're going to be launching people on it because 
with those six engines and the, the three engines, that's nine, if you have a thrust of 2300, sorry, 230 uh, tons, that's about 2000 tons of thrust at sea level, which should be enough to actually lift it in 1G. And if you underfuel it a little, it gives you a bar options. It gives you launch escape options while sitting on the stack at zero altitude. And if you're going to put humans on, having that kind of option when you're sitting on a, you know, four and a half thousand ton booster filled with propellant, that's definitely adds some, uh, some, uh, you know, <laughs> some safety factor to the whole thing. Um, also, which, what came up is like people for a long time have been getting the idea that Boca Chica is going to become this major spaceport just because they're building stuff there. And he made it clear that while Boca Chica is a fine place for them to build and develop the launch vehicles, Florida, right, that's where they're going to be doing most of the actual launches. That's where they're going to be launching, you know, three times a week or three times a day. Uh, Boca Chica, when they've done the app, when they did the application to the FAA, you know, it actually said, you know, something like five launches, orbital launches per year. And people looked at that and said, that makes no sense for a thing that's going to be rapidly reusable and, and whatever. And that is because it's being used as a development test area. If they are unable to get permission from FAA and the various other agencies to launch under their current review, under their current license, then it's going to take a long time to re-review everything and redo stuff and they won't be able to launch the booster from there in the meantime. That will mean they have to switch all the work to Kennedy. They will have to build the launch tower there, which will be, probably be a lot faster. They're going to have to spin up a booster factory there. Whereas in Boca Chica, they can probably still fly Starship underneath, under this uh, existing thing because of its mass and thrust are you can adjust them so that they are under the uh, parameters allowed for the Falcon Heavy. So even if they don't get uh, the review allowed or whatever uh, permission, they can still continue to do a lot of Starship related R&D at Boca Chica without changing the, the licensing. So yeah, that was the presentation. And I think the most interesting thing for me was you know, the Raptor 2 discussion. Um, but I think the most consequential stuff was addressing the environmental review uh, stuff. And just the fact that, you know, confirming that Kennedy will be the place where they're doing most of the orbital launches, regardless of uh, how the licensing happens at Boca Chica. And then uh, Boca Chica is still going to have R&D one way or another. Even if they're not allowed to launch boosters, they will still be able to test Starship. And yeah, that's great because... SpaceX does a lot of R&D. They love to mess around with these things. Uh, finally, the other thing, I guess, is Elon, you don't really have a career as a stand-up comedian, but don't worry, neither do I. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.